Hi, I'm Peter Kaufman from MIT Open Learning. A warm welcome to everybody who's turned out in person and online. Um, this is an extraordinary event. Uh, I'll give a 60 second introduction and throw to Chris Borg. Um, uh, there are a lot of natural disasters in the world that impede human progress from time to time. Uh, volcanoes and earthquakes and floods and uh, hurricanes and typhoons. Um, copyright is an entirely man-made catastrophe. <laughs> um, and, you know, theoretically, therefore, it might be able to be um, solved or improved or something. It's a broken promise, as the title of John Wilinski's a fantastic book says. Um, John uh, writes like uh, an angel and a poet, uh, um, uh, um, brilliantly. Uh, he's he's now, he's, <laughs> should I repeat that? And uh, he's now uh, campaigning um, for reform uh, of copyright. Um, Chris's activism and leadership is known to everybody in this room and on uh, the Zoom call. Um, you know, it's tough to be on the opposite side of either one of these people, but uh, good, good Lord, uh, try being on the other side of both. Um, without <laughs> further ado, uh, Open Learning welcomes you, Chris and John. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, so I'm Chris Berg. I'm the director of the libraries here at MIT and the founding director of CREOS, which is the Center for Research on Equitable and Open Scholarship at the MIT Libraries. It, thank you for inviting us over here. Um, well, well, I don't want to thank them on your behalf, John. I'll figure you'll do that. But thank you for inviting me. Um, it's it's a delight to be here and to be in conversation with John. Um, I promised John that I would tell one story. We John and I overlapped at Stanford for many, many years. Um, and we overlapped during a time when John was instrumental in um, advocating for and achieving an open access policy for the School of Education at Stanford. I was active in advocating for the Stanford libraries to harvest the publications that were therefore made open by that policy into the Stanford Digital Repository. I failed, John succeeded, <laughs> um, and I'm here at MIT now where we do in fact harvest the open access publications uh, that result from our faculty policy. I had no idea. I know, <laughs> <laughs> but I tried, John, just so you know, I tried and we can talk later about how and why I failed. Although you I know have. exactly how. I knew that I you would. <laughs> anyway, I'm here at MIT now um and for a lot of reasons um primarily because as you know john um mit has a sort of long and very proud history of supporting all things open um and the folks in this room know that very well um you know starting 20 years ago with ocw um ours was actually the first all campus faculty open yes. access policy passed unanimously uh by our faculty um and you know i often uh, claim that we have the highest compliance rate at about 55%. Um, I have claimed that all over the country and no one has contradicted me. So I just continue to assume that it is true. Um, we also, uh, in 2019, um, developed and endorsed something called the MIT Framework for Publisher Negotiations. Um, which was endorsed across campus and then by over 20, 200 research libraries across the country. Um, and in fact, very recently was cited by uh, the University of Washington uh, when they uh, walked away from their Elsevier big deal and by the University of Oregon who canceled their contract with uh, Elsevier recently and cited um, the influence of, uh, of our MIT framework. And of course, we... Um, uh, uh, ceased negotiations with Elsevier in June of 2020 in large part over open access issues um, as framed by our framework. Um, and we remain out of contract um, while we wait for Elsevier to provide a proposal that would align with our framework um, and would advance MIT's commitment to open and equitable scholarship. Um, but as your book points out, library negotiations with publishers is but one path um, to achieving the kind of open access to research publications that uh, there's a wide consensus is desirable um, and urgent. 
Um, and it's in fact an arduous path. <laughs> Having been in the trenches, that's a, a hard way to try and achieve a big goal. Um, your book lays out an alternative path, right? And it's based on the premise, as, as Peter sort of alluded to, that um, since it's copyright that allows publishers to restrict access to their publications, it's copyright that must be reformed in order to open up access to publications, um, or at least that that's a promising path. Yes, yes. Um, and that it is, and that it's also um, sort of logically and morally imperative, given that copyright's promise is to advance the progress of science, and that the progress of science is best, we, we now all acknowledge, is best uh, served by open access, open and equitable access to science publications, that therefore, if copyright is impeding open access to science, then copyright is impeding the progress of science rather than promoting it, which was its original purpose. So I think I got the book. I got the yeah, essence did, of the uh, book. Okay. Um, and it, moreover, John just sort of lays out the full case, right? Um, not just for copyright reform, um, but for a specific version of copyright reform that recognizes research publications as a special category um, and subject to statutory licensing, <laughs> much, much like um, what happens with music right now. Did I get it right? Absolutely. <sighs> okay. I think it's a really intriguing proposal. Um, certainly deserves wide debate and wide attention. Um, and, you know, the other part that I love about this book is that it, it provides sort of an impressive summary of the current state of OA, how we got to where we are, what efforts have been made um, to advance open, open access to scholarly publications, um, where they have succeeded, where, the, where there have been challenges and major roadblocks, and sort of your perspective on the prospects of various paths and why um, you see your path as your path. Um, <laughs> the path of copyright reform through statutory path. licensing as uh, sort of one of the more promising paths to get us sort of out of this, frankly, frustrating system of trying, as you call them, various workarounds, right? Um, so that's my summary of John's book, but I'm going to turn it over to him and see if he wants to sort of lay out uh, his own version and walk us through the argument um, and the proposal. Um, as well as kind of the evidence you've rallied to support the it's, it's great because you you have given the argument um, in hope <laughs> and all you've left out Taylor Swift which I really want to bring in at some point but um, what let me let me build on what you've said because now it's on the table uh, and let me try to frame it a little more dramatically uh, in terms of what we're looking at um, uh, because I have been um, I've had uh, extreme privilege of uh, uh, of a 60-day pre-publication tour of uh, Europe um, and the East Coast here, at least the Northeast Coast, um, the U.S. Uh, and so I have been facing a, a full range of challenges and questions, but also a chance to uh, hone my argument and to meet with all of the stakeholders. So the premises, one premise I want to put on the table is um, very important that you've said, but I think I want to emphasize, and that is this consensus that we have a stakeholder consensus we've never had before. In 2019, when the president, when the new president, when she, the new president of Elsevier, when she made her, one of her earliest uh, announcements at the Charleston conference, um, in such a lovely offhand kind of nonchalant, of course we support open access. Um, we are a publisher that is fully uh, behind open access and it is the right way to do science. Uh, and that way it wasn't long before the other big four uh, were uh, making similar kinds of statements. So we have something that we didn't have for two decades, um, which was a consensus. We had a very active lobbying against lobbying against any kind of open access initiative from the NIH, um, uh, open a public access policy um, to various initiatives that Spark and other groups tried to bring forward uh, in, in Congress. And so that, Building on the consensus makes copyright reform possible. I'm not the wild-eyed or wide-eyed optimist around this. I'm being very, very practical. A window has opened. 
And there's a limit on that because there, it will settle in in a way that will will lose some of the potential um, early enthusiasm around this, that we have an agreement that open access is the goal. And as a result of that, we can talk about the failure of the law and the failure of the market, not the failure of greedy publishers. So one of the uh, most important aspects of this whole presentation or the whole, sorry, the whole proposal, let's put it that way, um, is, uh, and, and what I would argue is uh, not the most poetic, although I appreciated that part really a lot, um, but the more original, um, is it says we need to do this with the publishers, not against the publishers. So uh, just before we started, Chris raised the OSTP announcement in August that we're going to a zero embargo in a kind of vague and ill-determined way, I'm afraid. But um, that to me, and this is the office of the White House, this is the office of science technology um, in the White House, um, that, ta that takes an oppositional stand to the publishers. We will try to work around the publishers by giving them zero embargo by virtue of law or executive order, I guess in this case. And so what I'm suggesting is that it, that misses out on, on the political momentum of a consensus. In the United States, they talk about an iron law of consensus for the chain, for changing copyright. The copyright has a complexity to it that requires that kind of coming together. And when I read about the iron law, I was pretty impressed. But when I saw what happened with the Music Modernization Act because of Taylor Swift, um, then I, I signed up. There is an iron law and it has been demonstrated to work. And we have that consensus. The second part I really want to emphasize is we are mired in a whole range of values in within scholarly work. The integrity of peer review, which actually is, um, and the integrity of our research, which is coming up at my institution in a big way at this point um, around Photoshop. Um, but the there are many issues um, that we are wrestling with. Uh, and the libraries are at the forefront of this in terms of many of these aspects around the access to knowledge and their circulation of knowledge and the quality of knowledge. I'm only addressing two. So I, I want you to hold me only to two very narrow aspects. One is universal open access to research publications, which we can talk about, at a fair price. Did you hear peer review? And that? No, no. It's open access. We need that immediately and urgently. And I'm really asking people, I'm not here to inform you. I am here to recruit you and to ask for your support and to and, and ask for your judgment. I'm not asking for your support. The support comes, it follows first, follows from the judgment. I'm asking for your judgment on whether or not open access merits a superordinate position among our values at this point for, a couple, for two reasons. One is we just came through a pandemic for heaven's sakes in which open science brought us and this right or next door uh, among this technology, which is not far from here, we've had, had great contributions in this regard in terms of uh, back to development of vaccines that we have seen that open science has saved lives and has got us through a horrific experience. I don't want to belittle that at all, a tragic, horrific experience um, in a redeeming way for open science, at least. So there is an urgency to the moment, and there is a coinciding of this consensus. And the consensus was confirmed just as much by the pandemic because the publishers immediately, before it was even called by the WHO a pandemic, took suspended copyright, you could say, technically the case, but suspended copyright for all COVID-related research, as if to say, when it's serious, holding science back is a crime against humanity. But otherwise, it's okay. Right. And if it's anything less than a pandemic, go ahead. We're locking it up. So this situation is such that I'm asking you to put open access for a short period of about four years. I'll tell you why four. Short period of four years at the forefront, ahead of other problems till we get it resolved. Universal. So what we have today is open access. Well, not really. It is individual articles, which we can count are open. But open access is either all the literature or it's not. If you have to guess which articles are open, if you go into a physician's office or into a researcher's office at a small institution, they're playing a lottery on what's going to be available to them. And that means the literature is not open and we're getting partial results. 
and no one can claim that they are in fact having exhausted the literature or having done a thorough literature review because we don't know if they've had complete access. So this urgency means that the judgment I'm asking from you in this situation and circumstances is based on your evaluation of the importance of open access now on a universal, immediate universal basis. Let me go back to the publishers. The other part I wanna emphasize is that the proposal I'm making is called statutory licensing. It has been successfully used, and this is this is where I come into my publisher sympathetic. Do we have any publishers here? We don't have uh, I'm meeting with MIT Press uh, later, but. I manage MIT Press, but. Oh yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. And you're, to me, but yeah. Other than that, okay. <laughs> All right, well here, so here Chris is my, watch. There, is that my sympathetic look? Yeah. So here's my sympathetic look for the publishers, or sympathetic approach to the publishers. I think it is our antagonism, and I've been a part of this for two decades, uh, has got us nowhere. It's got us nowhere. It's got us mired. So the sympathetic position with the publishers is as follows. The law that they are acting, the way they are acting, because the law no longer supports their practices. They had a very safe and secure legal environment legal gravitational field in which to operate with subscriptions and print, where they had the full, full weight of the law with uh, copyright infringement. And we know many, many cases in which they were successful in that regard, from Kinko's all the way down. Um, and all of a sudden they are recognizing and cannot avoid recognizing that we need to move to open access. Only the law is not there. There is nothing within the law, not fair use, not any stipulation that differentiates research from any other form of publication to protect them. And so we're asking them to go into this unknown territory. And the fact they're dragging their heels like a child on his way to school shouldn't surprise us. And that they would create, read, and publish contracts of such complexity to further lock down subscriptions is a natural response to retain the support of the law. So when I say the law is at fault, I am in a sense choosing the thing that we can change as opposed to taking all the intellectual property away from the publishers, which has been proposed to me many, many times, uh, as opposed to killing all the corporations, which has also been proposed to me less than 24 hours ago uh, that we burn them to the ground. Um, uh, I had to report that. You know, it was, no, it was Homeland Security. No, no, no. This is being recorded. Being <laughs> <It's been> recorded. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, sorry, that was an overstatement. Uh, right. um, yeah, truly. So what what this means is the publishers are put in an untenable position. They do not have a story, and I am speaking to the publishers. I have. Uh, uh, the, the, the line I've got from one publisher, um, from the legal counsel of one publisher, is the narrative is broken. Um, and I have, I do not have publishers wholesale, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have, oh, excuse me, I don't have publishers uh, outspoken support at this point for this proposal. But I have been impressed by uh, their willingness to engage in conversations with me at a very high level, VP and legal counsel. Uh, and I have been very impressed by their willingness to tell me, uh, to confirm one of my points, only one, unfortunately, but one, an important one, is they're facing a great degree of uncertainty in terms of their economic planning for a future of complete open access. They are taking all the money they can off the table right now because they can tell that story to their shareholders. But shareholders, think about pension plans, think about long-term shareholders who will not accept the the point uh, will not accept a story that says, and we don't know what will happen after that when we get to complete open access, because we, especially after they've endorsed it. So that brings me to this point of market failure. So we have, uh, and this is not, again, publishers are a part of this, but they, um, that their actions are warranted by the current state of the legal system. So we have what, what is called market failure because we have an agreed upon good for all of humanity, for heaven's sakes, an agreed upon good that the market is not able to deliver in a timely fashion at a fair market price. The two things the market was supposed to do with an invisible hand, <laughs> it's not doing. And, and I, it's easy to document the case. In the book, 
you'll notice I cite research that shows the current rate of growth of open access. And I do a very off the back of an envelope calculation for that future. And it's like four decades, maybe three if I some miracle. Mm -hmm. So I want you in your minds right now to calculate how many pandemics is four decades. Good. 3.7, I'm seeing. Okay. 2.8 is optimistic. <laughs> All right. Uh, so how, what degree of climate catastrophe do we have in, in four decades? Uh, yeah, exactly. The side. Back here, yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, it is a completely uh, untenable, unsustainable, uh, not to mention library budgets in terms of, of unsustainability, um, that we are proceeding at this pace. So if there is a market failure, um, what I have learned as a student of the law for all of three years, um, like a continual law one, oh one. Um, what uh, I realized is that there is a legal remedy. This stunned me when they would talk about there's a legal remedy for market failure. And it has been successfully tested in this country, in many countries, but in this country for 100, excuse me, 112 years, 113 years, 113 years. And it is called statutory licensing. When the market fails to deliver a desired good at a fair price, what statutory licensing does is it arrives at agreement between the buyers and the sellers to establish the delivery of that desired good at a reasonable and fair price. Mm -hmm. So I'm suggesting uh, in my proposition for a statutory license, uh, actually, but let me pause for one second and say that uh, there are two parts of this argument. One is, and Chris set this up beautifully, the one is, do we need to change the law? And I'm arguing, actually, that it's time to change the law, whatever we do. <clears throat> but if we're going to change the law, open access is our number one priority. Because the law and its broken promise is that it is a detriment to the progress of science, is an impediment to the progress of science and therefore, Congress, the Congress, without passing this law in a kind of negative effect, is acting unconstitutionally. It has the power to act in order to promote, not to deter. So your support in this um, turns out to be key and instrumental. And let me put on the table uh, quickly what the actual proposal is for me. But the first, but let me again to emphasize the distinction I'm making. I'm asking you to first endorse or consider, make a judgment. Sorry, I keep getting ahead of myself. Did I say endorse? <laughs> Excuse me. I'm asking you to judge whether we are due to consider reforming copyright in our conversations and our agendas around open access. Should copyright reform be on the agenda? Because it has not been in this country. It actually is in the EU, um, as I've discovered. Uh, that's the first point. And that's independent of my, I mean, that's my argument, but it's independent of my proposal. You can treat my, you can dismiss my proposal as an example of, or sorry, as, as an example of how that might work. Like, could we actually do this? And I'm convinced we actually could do it. It's whether there could be a better way of doing it, for sure. Uh, whether this is too cumbersome, um, it is cumbersome. Um, though that's open for debate but it does demonstrate that we could bring this about now. Why I said four years um, is because of Taylor Swift. Um, so in 2014, Taylor Swift pulled her music from, from spots. Does anyone know this, recognize it? Yes, I look at you know, kind of the hurt. That was hard, it was difficult. She pulled her music from Spotify um, and in 2014. And in 2018, the United States government changed the law. and didn't just change the law, passed a 67 page bill, Music Modernization Act, unanimously in the House and in the Senate. First time ever, apparently, I still can't quite believe this, but I read it, uh, this had happened, bipartisan support. So the clock is ticking. I was gonna set my, okay, good. Four <laughs> years from now, we are gonna see a bill, the Scholarship Modernization Act, um, or sorry, the, the Taylor Swift uh, mm -hmm. Scholarship Modernization Act. Um, and, the, and the act is going to propose um, among its 67 pages of details. Um, and there are some other proposals I, I would support, but in my particular one is a statutory license in which research publications 
which will become a new category of work. I can talk about that and Chris has uh, some good questions, but a good question of it. Research publications must be published on an immediate open access basis for which the publishers will receive fair compensation under law from the uh, institutional users and funders. So we have a concept of research publications only that this applies to. We have immediate open access, which this, uh, for those publications, we have the publishers legally qualifying for fair compensation, which I will describe to you, uh, from institutional users uh, and funders. And what that means, the fair compensation is a very big question, but in the Music Modernization Act, uh, sorry, in the 1909 Copyright Act, where this was first introduced, the fee was set by the law, not by the musicians, not by the performers, not by the publishers, but by the law. And it stayed that way for decades. Now, and in the Music Modernization Act, there are three copyright judges, which I think is, lacks a little trust in judges. They had to have three. But anyway, I appreciate the point. Three copyright judges listen to the stakeholders and operate on what I think are stupendous principles. They do not make a judgment about what is music or not. They make a judgment about whether they have before them a willing buyer and a willing seller. And so the libraries in this case for fair compensation would be the willing buyers of some services, some level of profit margin if it could be demonstrated to be an investment in goods that va are valued by the com academic community at large. The, lo the publishers will provide services in order to attract willing buyers that will speak as well to questions of quality, questions of data simulation, questions of discoverability, other aspects that are of value by the academic community. And they will argue over the pricing and they will do things like we will not deliver it for that price in one year. You'll have to pay for three years in order. All those kinds of debates will be heard by the judges. And the judges will send the parties back if they are not willing sellers to willing buyers. Just as they'll send the willing buyers back if they are not in a position to, to respond to the willing seller uh, price range pinches or fee structure or tiered sales levels. We can talk about the details of that. So that, that to me, and I and and uh, repeatedly I get pushed back on two things here um, that I want to sh share with you. So what this would mean is, sorry, let me start with the, stay with the publishers for one second. So why this is so important to the publishers, I hope I don't have to tell you why it's so important to libraries, because this would be the first time you have legal recourse for fair compensation. First time you have a court of appeal, and first time you have a discerning point of judgment about what you're willing to pay for and what you're willing to pay for that. For the publishers, they're giving up the right to set the price because they can only propose what is fair. And in exchange, they're getting a predictability of the future of open access. They're able to tell their shareholders that we are confident that we will get be fairly compensated into the future. And the shareholders will say, is that zero profit? And the publishers will say, no, there will be a profit margin because we cannot operate and we cannot invest and we cannot have a future in terms of new developments unless there is a surplus or a reserve or however you want to frame it, it's a profit. So this, this way of speaking to all of the interests, the researchers, so, so I've given you the library interests, I've given you the publishers interests. And remember, we're coming together on a common goal. Open access is the shared goal that applies to all the stakeholders. There are no stakeholders at the table in scholarly publishing that are standing against open access in principle and in practice. But each of the individual stakeholders have a particular interest. And one of my favorites is the researchers because that's my camp, that's my group. And so the researchers, what they gain is, whoosh, I'm freed of the responsibility of managing an unwieldy, incomprehensible, incredibly complex system, which I am not fully capable of exercising and which I'm not exercising to the full capacity. We are putting on researchers the responsibility of delivering open access 
and they are not reading the details. They are not playing the system well. They are overspending at every point, and they're not exercising their right to create green deposit. And so this system would say, you're not involved. You as an author can submit to any publisher you want and know that your work will be open. It doesn't take $11,000 to get an open nature article. It takes nothing but you to write something or, or research something so with such skill and such originality and such boldness that you'll get onto the cover of nature. And so this idea is part of this equitable scholarship, which I so appreciate Chris having started a few years ago when we, last time we met it back, was the beginning. Um, to, the sense is that the, pub, the authors are very big winners. It's totally respectful of academic freedom. It's not saying you need to submit where it's open. It's not saying you need to manage your own embargoes. It's not saying that you need to save your final copy of something you can share. It's not something you need to wade through six screens full of Springer legal uh, material. So uh, let me, I've got the libraries, I've got the publishers, I've got the authors. Scholarly societies are an interesting one. Again, I'm a member of scholarly societies, multiple scholarly societies, and I'm a supporter of those societies and I've worked with them. Um, and I see them having to have turned their intellectual property and their efforts over to commercial publishers in a way that this would provide some relief from. Right now, the publishers guarantee them more money than they were able to make as independent publishers. But under this system, the fair compensation they would qualify for on the same terms as, let's take Wiley as an example, since it's the largest host, if you like, of uh, scholarly societies, hundreds of scholarly societies published through Wiley. So they will have a choice because their compensation, in a sense, will be guaranteed. Guaranteed if their publications are considered to be research publications, and I need to get to that point. So we have scholarly societies, we have librarians, we have their libraries, we have publishers, the funders, which I appreciate having some uh, representation here for, Ross. Uh, the funders are uh, an important element in this um, because they are the sponsors of research and they are uh, equally uh, outspoken. In the, uh, and again, I've been this has been tempered in terms of my approach, but uh, a large number of them are outspoken in support of open access. Um, and again, I would remind you that uh, the sponsorship of research that is not shared openly limits the impact of any funder's work. Uh, and so it is in the funder's interest and service to have open access to the research. What the funders are missing and what I'm offering to the funders, not only this common goal of open access, um, but a level of accountability they haven't previously had, uh, which seems to me a paramount value among funders to be accountable to um, their spending and, their, and responsible in their spending. And that is because uh, the funders will be uh, paying for all of the publications of all of the research um, that they sponsor. And this will give them um, a new level of accountability because they will, be not, they will not turn money over to researchers to either spend or not spend, either gain open access or not gain open access, to either overpay to some publishers or uh, perhaps not pay as much to others. They will in fact uh, be part of a fair compensation. They will know that they're paying a fair price and they will have a seat at the table in establishing a fair price for the publication of the research. So these, and, and we'll have a level of accountability in terms of the minute it's published. We'll have a full index or a full accounting. Let me go to the, to the research publication question just briefly. And then and perhaps Chris, see if I can address some of, you, of your concerns. Uh, and this has come up, uh, you're in very good company, Jane Ginsburg. <laughs> Uh, distinguished legal scholar, Pamela Samuelson, another one, uh, have both raised this. Um, I'm, again, this naive student of the law at this point, um, but I was impressed by the United States law. It has eight other categories of works, uh, not research and scholarship. Um, research and scholarship is considered to be a literary work. Um, when I'm honored, okay, you know, because <laughs> I am a poet and, and I wanted to be there with the other poets and novelists uh, and screenwriters, all the others, and songwriters. Um, but the, uh, I was kind of shocked when I read through the list, uh, particularly when I got to the letter P, because pantomime is a category of work. 
Now, this is an easy target for me to say that, of course, Marcel Marceau was like nobody, you know, was more impressed by what he could do with his hands and his body. Um, but the United States created a category of work for pantomime and lets research and scholarship languish under literary works is a little perturbing to me. Um, we have choreography, of course, I'm a big fan of dance. And we have architectural drawings and I'm, uh, architectural works, technically. I'm very big on that. We have dramatic and non-dramatic music and we have dramatic works, which used to be part of literary works, but was pulled out in order to tailor the law. And what I'm asking is we create a eighth category. I say eight, sorry, seven. So we have seven categories, not eight. Seven and, and research publications would be the eighth category. We would create an eighth category called research publications to which this statutory licensing would apply alone, nowhere else. So it would not affect the commercial lives of singers, songwriters, poets, everyone else. And we would define it as, in, in, a, in a brief sentence or two, and, and I've studied the copyright uh, definitions, there are about three or four lines, something that makes reference to peer review, editorial oversight by scholars and validation of works. And we would have to set up a registry as the music industry has for works, which record who owns, who has the rights. And I'll talk a bit about the rights in a moment. Uh, and we would have to have a board or some body of appeal for what is a scholarly work, excuse me, a research publication. So I'm only referring to the act of publication because the publishers are the ones who are gonna be fairly compensated for publication. No preprints because it, there's not that same investment. Uh, not data sets to start with at least in this, in my stipulation, because I want universal open access to research publications. And the uh, decisions about it will be based on our advantage over the music industry. So the music industry has to make these decisions, but they don't have a whole profession represented in this room in such stellar fashion that is devoted to making discerning judgments about what is, oh, thank you so much. What is, is that irritating? I, I, do, I did pick up a cold. Welcome to rainy, wet, cold, uh, Northeast uh, New England. Um, the, we have uh, not only a profession devoted to information science, to making decisions about research. Um, we have a, an accompanying data science. We have incredible indexes and lists that will be, there will be debates around, no question. Uh, and we have a, 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 what I think are magnificent tracking systems like Crossref and DOIs, uh, counter for counting uh, usage. So we have all of the pieces in place to manage, which remember the music industry had none of. Um, there were there were no nobody had a profession of I'm an information scientist of music no um, and so we have that kind of and we have back to volume one issue one uh, kinds of information about these things whereas the music industry is still debating um, stuff from before 1972 so <laughs> excuse me so this idea that we we create a registry has been controversial because uh, what about brand new innovative research. Um, what about controversial research? Uh, what about work that is being challenged because it's there is photoshopping um, of the uh, data sets and things like that? And so, uh, which I, yes. So, uh, what I want to say is that we have those discussions right now. We have those debates right now, and I cannot guarantee any perfect method for making those decisions because I've been a scholar long enough to know. We will never get to that point, but we do make judgments. Every tenure and promotion committee makes life altering judgments on whether there is research or not. Um, and so don't ask me about textbooks, for example, that's been decided, that's not research. And, and so these things are not for me to decide, these are things that will be decided. And the other advantage of this is that the judges sit as a, a board of appeal, a court of appeal, if you like, for all of these kinds of decisions. Like how much weight should we put on downloads and readership? How much weight should we put on publication? All of these things will be part of strategies that libraries will come forward with. How about big libraries versus small libraries, law libraries versus other libraries? These will be strategic elements that every five years, and this is a lovely part of statutory licensing, is the courts don't make a ruling as they do in other areas for crimes where you can appeal up to a certain point and then it is done. No one appeals the Supreme Court decision. This one, 
In the case of statutory licensing, it's episodic or periodic. You come back every five years. You build a new case. You bring new data. You have some wins and some losses in the judgments of the, of the court, and you come back better equipped and prepared. And believe me, they, the, the publishers, the funders, they will all come to the table this way, the scholarly societies. Um, and I can give you examples of uh, case, you know, works that will fall outside and inside. The authors, in terms of their academic freedom, can decide not to participate. We talk, I talk jokingly about the Stevens, the three or four Stevens. We have uh, Stephen Greenblatt would not participate in that. Stephen Hawking, if we find a manuscript of his, <laughs> posthumously will not participate because they will go to trade. They will not ask for fair compensation. They will not have a guarantee. They will take their chances on the market. Do you, do you know the Stephen I'm missing? Stephen King. Yeah, the Canadian. Thank you. Um, so they they have they run a different market. So the publisher, and again, MIT Press is a really good example. It's having great success in trade with its little snappy essential knowledge series. And so they'll make a decision. And in the humanities, if I could make my appeal to the present company, um, Chris, uh, if, if in the humanities, where the monograph is, uh, some would say a threatened beast, certainly in some disciplines, uh, American history, not so much, but Latin American history, yes, and English. Um, the publishers will then have that same kind of assurance they don't have with open access today. And that is, they know their sales are going down, but in this case, they will ask to be fairly compensated. And that will be determined, uh, and this is where the librarians, the subject area librarians will be so important, so vital. That will be determined in light of the size of the pre predicted market. So a Latin American historian will be fairly comp the publisher of a Latin American history will be fairly compensated at a relatively low level compared to histories of American presidents, which uh, will probably go to trade, actually. They wouldn't be clearly, but say uh, histories of... of uh, history. You can also renegotiate for your uh, internet can. Can... Oh, okay. It was a, well, that was the minister. We'll have a question for you in a second. Yeah. All right. So, in fact, I'm coming to the end and some of these things. So I'm happy to, to work through the examples that would include university presses, which I didn't actually pull out separately, but I'd be happy to. And as I said, I'm going to have a chance to speak with MIT as a leading the, the, at the forefront in terms of this whole open access initiative, uh, leading press, um, and look at different instances with you. Um, but what I, 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 what I want to say is that the, the lesson I've, I've learned in all of this is that this is not a, a, a selling of the book is public, is open access, it's freely available. So I'm not promoting the book. Uh, I am promoting the book, but I'm not selling the book. Sorry, there's a gentleman up there. He's uh, he's you the book. Oh, yeah, he's selling the Press is selling the book and providing it open. Uh, yeah, so direct to open program. Um, I'm suggesting that this idea can die on the vine, and that's your judgment. Um, but to go forward, um, to take it to, the, to and here, Jane. Uh, Ginsburg again is uh, very forthright to take to bring it to the copyright copyright office to ask for something like public hearings to give it a larger uh, venue and I don't and I think even before the copyright office I think we should just bring this up at, at our conferences and events um, we need to have uh, I and have been asked repeatedly it's you and whose army kind of uh, as, as kids we would say that kind of statement you and whose army. Um, and in this case, uh, I am directly appealing, um, as I did up the road, uh, uh, up the river um, earlier, yesterday, um, for expressions of interest, expressions of interest in seeing this discussed. And statutory licensing is one, it's Walensky's proposal, but copyright reform should be all of ours. Because what I have forgotten to mention, what I failed to mention at this point, and what was a stunning revelation to me is up to the, uh, I've been doing this for uh, 25 years and I thought nobody wants to go near copyright. Copyright is impossible to change. It would be foolish and naive to try to do that. Um, running out of time, I'm sure. Um, but that uh, in fact, the law has been changed 60 times since the introduction of the internet in say 1989, 87, 88, 89, since the introduction of the uh, internet, 60 times the law has been changed. 
but not once for research or scholarship. In 1976, it was changed for scholarship because we could photocopy one article by breaking the back of a journal and, excuse me, slapping it onto the machine. Um, but it is overdue. But that's a weak argument that we should just do it because it's our turn. Uh, because, and anyone would know that video game locks are far more important in this country and that now they're taken care of, now that uh, cell phone locks are taken care of, now that <coughs> Taylor Swift streaming has been taken care of, maybe uh, it would be uh, not untoward to raise uh, science and research and scholarship, given we just went through a pandemic and where it was demonstrated to be so effective. So that's the whole scope generally, but I'm, I would welcome uh, your questions and points. But I would also ask you to think about what in your sphere of activity, what in your organization could you do about expressing if you are convinced, if, if in your judgment, open access has a necessary uh, element to the progress of science. Um, in fact, perhaps the one that we can most best control um, going forward and best uh, contribute to in this particular period of the post pandemic break uh, amidst a onset of climate catastrophe, I'm afraid. Um, whether your where your circle of influence could begin to simply say we would like to see this given further consideration, and you are able to cite our organization as having that interest, um, because that again I love when people come to me and say, "So where's your list? Where who, who's who has an interest in this? Like if it's just you, forget it. You're not even American friends." Yeah. So, uh, but I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm going to change that I, 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 for this purpose of only. Uh, uh, right. so, so let's let's okay. open it up to questions. I have a few, but I actually have access to you, John, after this. So okay. let me let's open it up to questions um, from the room or from the remote participants at this point. Yes. Or I can yeah, yeah. I have a comment more than a question. I got yeah. Peter referred to this 2030 working group, the open 2030 working group that he and uh, Kurt put together. That's certainly an event and conference that could have this as a main topic within the next year. Uh, and it's several of the people that are on the screen are members of that organization. And that group should not have a, a, a book reading in a sense and come back and, and report about what they've read and talked about. And one other comment, uh, early on, you talked about open access at a fair price. And I wondered how you were going to describe that. And then you did. And I think some of the things you're thinking about are brilliant. And uh, um, last question, uh, the Taylor Swift uh, Research Publication Act. Are you suggesting that Taylor Swift will be a senator within the, within the next four years? Mm -hmm. Um, she she is I, I, I and I, I mean I, I'm making light yeah. of this, but I am serious about her work in copyright. Yeah. So there are multiple levels I'd be very happy to go into, in which she is a leading light around the rights of composers and musicians. And uh, I mean, just let me just refer to her re-recording re, re her performances. One one thing that Taylor Swift uh, has, and the, the fact that Taylor accepted. Uh, this is what shocked, again, this is naive, my naive sense. When I realized that she did that uh, and was prepared to accept her inability to set the price for, for Spotify, like she, uh, she was upset with the price she was getting from Spotify, but she did not insist on setting it. She let the courts decide. Um, and the fact that she does not exclude, she is, has a non-exclusive right to her music. She is under a compulsory license. She is compelled to license it to anybody who pays. No matter how badly or poorly they perform her work, she cannot withdraw their or refuse their license. So, so that's, that to me was the comparable part, that it is the price setting of the courts of an appeal and the fact that we're only going to give the publishers, just as Taylor has, Taylor has a right of first performance now that's mechanical, it's not like on the stage. <laughs> she can assign it, by the way, but but once she records that music and she no one can record it before, that would be infringement. No one can force her to perform it. Uh, but once she performs it, she then it is open to anyone else. And so we're going to say in this case, the comparable case here is going to be the authors are going to grant the publisher a right of first publication and the publisher does has that control. 
responsibility to decide when it's publishable. So we're not taking away that point of judgment or discernment on the publisher's part. They're not forced to publish open access research. They have a, an exclusive right to be the first publisher of a work of research. Once they've published it, they are they qualify for compensation. So they and and after that, the rights as I propose. Now this could be uh, modified, but my proposal is the author retains all the other rights. So they grant a non-exclusive right of first publication when they feel the work is ready for that. Uh, and so the publisher won't have any secondary rights. The publisher won't be able to remarket in some way. The publisher won't be able to charge for back issues. Uh, they will be able to charge, sorry, when we start, I can talk about back issues. There's a whole body of work that will need to be considered. But once it's published, the libraries will have complete access. We'll be able to eliminate all the locks and protection, which is hugely expensive. And so you will not be a willing buyer of any kind of mechanisms for locks. But let me, to, yes. Well, well, we got a, an online question okay. from Jeff and then, and then Catherine. Jeff. Hey, so um, first of all, I just wanted to thank you for uh, doing uh, this talk um, and especially allowing for us to participate online. Um, my question is, uh, you mentioned that the, the copyright law has changed, um, you know, over 60 times uh, since 80, 87, uh, because of the introduction of the internet. Um, one of the recent um, changes to copyright law has been the institution of the CASE Act, um, where we have the Copyright Claims Board uh, being set up uh, to have small claims of copyright infringement. Um, what is your impression of that um, being enacted and this Copyright Claims Board um, and their you know, potential impact on open access or, or open educational resource adoption? Um, Jeff, I, I'm gonna need your help with some of this, I think. Uh, but let me just say, uh, generally, um, this will, uh, not supersede, but this will be separate from that because there will be no copyright, uh, if the work is immediately open access uh, and the author retains the right and the publisher has exercised their one right for first publication, the uh, publishers are in no position to take go to court over it, any infringement. Um, the, they can go to court on a different basis, which is they were not fairly compensated. So if the library, if a library like MIT said, we're going to free ride, it's so unlikely, but if, the, if a library said, we're not going to pay because everything's a free and we've had a really rough year budgetary wise, um, the publishers would be able to, under this law, take them to court uh, and to sue them uh, for infringement of the law. Um, so there wouldn't be, it's, it removes the uh, small claims copyright infringements that I believe that was set up to handle. Uh, and creates a superordinate, if you like, on a very narrow band of research publications, whereas that the board is uh, all copyright. So I, I, you know, you can help me with this if I'm off on it, but um, this would set up a different kind of circumstance. It would not read, it would, uh, it's interesting to predict, and I, I would defer to better minds on this, uh, around the amount of litigation, um, whether this would increase or decrease the amount it would certainly stop any takedown notices and it would uh, generally uh, free up the kinds of infringement uh, issues that we see. Um, because the libraries are such good players, I mean, a library is very likely, is very unlikely to say, for example, uh, we don't want to pay for nature anymore. No one read nature on this campus. Um, so that's not likely to happen. Um, similarly, the free riding, libraries are not likely to say we're not paying, uh, you know, even though we have demonstrable use. Um, there will be thresholds. So my conception, and this is my conception, uh, I want to. I'm not a school teacher by trade. I want to protect the high schools uh, access, and so I would propose that there are thresholds of use um, by the public and by uh, professions um, where they would be not institutional users. So I'm making a distinction that I don't think would need to be spelled out in the law that we at MIT and Stanford use research in a way that is very different than any, I mean, it's just so vital to our, our existence. Um, whereas others consult research, we use the research and it, it, it is essential and integral to our work. Coming to your question. So 
Um, this, this kind of, of regulation, um, I'm prepared to, uh, there will be unintended aspects to it, um, but in the particular case of the legal structure, this and this is part of the weight of it, Jeff, is that it means a whole new structure has to be put into place and it won't be able to take advantage of, for example, the, the measures that you're talking about uh, because they are serving a different purpose. Uh, thank you. And, and then also, um, I think I'm spying a few copies of the book uh, in, in the room. So I'm hoping uh, to, you know, there might be a copy for open learning. Uh, but I think you mentioned that it's, uh, is it, has it already been released? Is it something we can- It was can, released uh, yesterday, you know, open access on the MIT Press website. Yeah, it's awesome. very fresh. And it's Thank still warm. Uh, <laughs> coming off the press. Please. Uh, Yes, thank you so much for that. It's very interesting. My name is Catherine. I'm a librarian here at MIT. So um, I really want to, and, and this is probably not for now because we only have 15 minutes left, but I want to know what what are the, how how you see the mobilization of this in, in specific terms. But I, I'm curious about how this in practice actually wouldn't be antagonistic to publishers because as soon as we wouldn't they mobilize the minute that we mobilized uh, in the lobbying uh, Congress to make these changes? They would mobilize. They don't want a fair price. They want the price that they can get. So I don't understand why this wouldn't end up. So, so let me repeat yeah, this part. So the conversation I'm having with the publishers is based on the principle they've accepted, at least so far. It, they've accepted it because they can make money off of it. Yes, and they still will make money. So I dis this proposal disappoints a lot of people who want to kill or eliminate the publishers. This does not eliminate the commercial corporate publishers. It does not reduce the size. It does not prevent them from, it, I mean, antitrust laws will prevent them from merging to the extreme. Maybe. But it, it um, provides them with a, an economic certainty over which they uh, do not have a control right now in terms of open access. It calls them on their words, so there has to be an element of trust. It would not be lobbying against. What we saw with the Music Modernization Act is we saw every element of the industry coming together to support the act because there were no dissenting votes, so no one was getting additional political money in order to vote no, which is, happens all the time otherwise, I'm afraid, in this country, um, as Larry Lessig will tell you. Um, but what it does do is, is, is it gives them, there will be lobbying on, on how it's framed. There'll be lobbying on what is a research publication. Will publishers have a chance to say what is a research publication? Well, I would say yes, but li libraries may say no, it should be all, you know. So there, there will be debates on the details, um, but it, there cannot be a publisher, I'm suggesting, who can lobby against open access at this point. And there cannot be a publisher who will lobby against fair pricing. They will say, we have fair pricing and we don't need this apparatus for it. But if you want to, we can convince the judges that we have fair pricing because we totally believe it. And they will be able to, and I, I tried to make that example earlier, but profit. This is not anti-profit because that is a necessary element uh, for corporate existence and for the future of something as elaborate as scholarly or anti-revenue generation. Sorry, profit, profit is a heavy word. Oh, anti revenue. Just... Revenue. Yeah, I like revenue better. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's, well, but the profit is what people are very upset about. So, I mean, are we good? Can I? We're, we're pretty good. And we've got one now online. <laughs> yeah, but go ahead. Okay, there are two out right yeah. here. So, one more. Let's go online. Kayla? Um, hi. So, I think I might be closer to one of the other camps that you were describing, but I guess in my view, why should we, the public, the, the taxpayers that are funding this research, be locked into a model that props up their dying business models? Uh, thank you for that. Um, we uh, are doing this because our colleagues in the universities, the researchers and scholars have voted. Uh, I've worked for 20 years to, uh, prior to this uh, to create an alternative system using open source software um, that has been reasonably successful, um, but has not convinced the majority of scholars to move away from the commercial publishers. So this is not, the commercial publishers are not propped up. They are deeply engaged in the work of publishing the majority, the vast majority of researchers. And if I could have convinced the researchers to move away from the commercial publishers by building an alternative system as I did, 
um, then I wouldn't be making this kind of argument. The publishers now own 50%, the five major publishers own 50% by some calculations of the literature from the global north at least. Um, and that ownership puts them in a position that we cannot walk away from. We cannot start over. We cannot build a system that does not include them because then we will be cutting ourselves off. And at this point, the choice is between letting them set the prices uh, with the support of all of, with a, with a majority of researchers, letting them set the prices or having a court of appeal with the majority of researchers continuing to support them. Once we have open access, once we have this in place, we can perhaps convince our colleagues and researchers to move to independent scholar-led publishing operations, library hosted, university press hosted. But we will wait, if we're waiting for the publishers to go away in terms of their dying business model, then we have decades ahead of us without open access and with no check on price. Was that too harsh, Kim? <laughs> Look, can my question was kind of pointed, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I so appreciate the pointed question and I appreciate the answer because it gets to what the question I was going to ask. And let me make sure, that, and I'm going to be pointed to my interpretation of oh, yeah. your response, John, which is I think what you're saying. So you start off by saying the moment is now. We've got consensus that open access is a good yes, thing. Thank you. Everybody and every player agrees, including scholars. Um, I think what you've just said is scholars agree in principle, but they're not going to change their behavior. And no. therefore, we have to work around scholars. No, the scholars, that would be my my It's worse. It's worse. Oh. <laughs> scholars are uh, not trained and are essentially incompetent at bringing about open access on a large scale because this is not their work. Okay. It's taken me decades to get to this point to be sitting with you here describing okay. this, uh, and for a scholar to spend a half hour every three months on this is yeah. is mm -hmm. we shouldn't be trusting them to, for this aspect it's unfair i don't to, yeah okay i'm not sure to, that's the only but, but scholar this is the the uh the the elephant in the table is the prestige economy of scholarly publishing and this yeah. model it's not so much that i entrench the entrench the publishers the bigger fault could be said to be i don't touch the prestige model i don't touch nature lancet a uh, cell because i I think touching that will take a longer period and we can still go after it. I only wanted to solve two things that I think are more urgent. The prestige economy is a retardant to the progress of science in a way that is less significant, I think, than open access. And the weight of corporate publishing, like I don't deny corporate publishing is taxing the system because I've seen the salaries of the CEOs and, and others involved. But I don't think going after that will get us to open access, which is this key kernel for the improvement of science and humanity, the health and well-being of humanity, in the way, I mean, quick, well, it's also quickly enough that this doesn't preclude that. This doesn't cut that yeah. off. Nothing in this says, I'm propping up the publishers. Nothing in this says, we must fund commercial publishing in order to have research publications. There is nothing in this with, that would prevent publishers moving wholesale to MIT Press or to journals hosted by the library. Okay, we have two questions right here. On that, on that last point, yes. first of all, I think it's really good that you're calling the Scholarship Modernization Act or naming it after Taylor Swift rather than Jonathan Swift, <laughs> who did the modest proposal that talked about selling the Irish selling their children to a sort of British. For, um, but it's a kind of an all or nothing thing. Uh, and you've given us four years. In essence, yeah. So, so like, 2030 is really the yeah. That's too far off. <laughs> but I have a question because some of our favorite funders are uh, on Zoom. In essence, with us here, Arcadia, Michelson. Um, there is, and you began to hive them off, like a non nonprofit publishing. Yeah. There's that. There's not really nonprofit publishing in the music business. Mm -hmm. So that that economy is a little different. Yeah. We have we have now this this ban. You know, led uh, no doubt by MIT Press, my second favorite publisher in the world. Um, <laughs> sorry, um, okay, okay. Uh, but the the uh, what what interim uh, uh, models, uh, pilots, like other things can be launched and supported with perhaps the intervention 
of the foundation world or of certain sure. agencies or other, we can we concern ourselves with that. Without that in original intervention, uh, open courseware wouldn't exist. No, no. So open courseware, pub pub, uh, all these different elements are interim measures. I, I would ask for credit for 25 years of working on the public knowledge project to build an interim solution, to build an alternative. And to Kalen's point, that I I I went down that road until three years ago. Yeah. Like I did not look to, I did not ask anyone to consider the law mm -hmm. for 20 years, for 19 years until, or 20 years, until I finally realized that I was creating, I was showing another world was possible. Mm -hmm. We have 34,000 journals using OJS, the Open Journal Systems, yeah. and I had 80% from the Global South. So we showed another world was possible mm -hmm. in terms of the Occupy movement, um, but that's not how science that's not for the best of science, having another world. What's best for the future of science is having one open world yeah. and one open science ethos. So it, it, um, the four-year thing is really important because we have the interim models that are just creating a piecemeal response with no end in view. Is it publicly funded? Is it the fair copy or the final draft? Is it an embargo? Is it... We have created a, an incredible array that is not getting us to the desired goal, but is spinning. And the complexity, I don't know, Chris, it's just increasing in terms of the read and publish kinds of contractual arrangements and the accountability. And we are continuing to put it on the authors. And that is a bad, well, yeah, not really. So. Okay. Uh, then I will finish that sentence. <laughs> I have such respect for it. <laughs> Uh, back here. Yeah. Oh, um, the the wealth of analogies that are firing off in my mind about this, I think, is testament to how the rich and important this conversation is. I will start off by saying there is a nonprofit music publishing world. I'm a part of it. We do stuff, and we don't make any money from it. And from my perspective, and in, in, in that community, the Music Modernization Act and what went on around Spotify negotiations took a bad situation and just destroyed it. So we're completely squashed outside of it. And I and I and I you know I think very much about the situation of less resourced institutions in the global south and this alternative infrastructure. What I'm taking from your conversation is um, to to try your your charge to us is to have some clarity that none of this is taking anything away from that alternative infrastructure, right? No, that is that is still you know an amazing thing in its own right, and people will continue to access it. This is really focused on the big industrial. No, 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 no because it is it doesn't take away it gives. Because if you are running a, a diamond journal, yeah. which is now the term, yeah. then you are you warrant fair compensation. Um, so it says the funding model needs to support the whole of the system. And in, in the global south, there will be local jurisdictions where they will say, we will pay Elsevier because we're, we're institutional users of Elsevier, but we will tax and reserve funds for Brazilian or Argentinian or whatever, local public, Canadian, local publications. And we already do that to a certain extent, so that would just extend that. So we haven't talked about the global, <laughs> excuse me, the global implications of this, but I'd be prepared to. But it's not just that we're leaving that alone. We are saying this is a vital, this diamond or this uh, library sponsored publishing world yeah. is as deserving as the commercial publishers. And they will be in a position to increase their uh, ability to offer services. There may be debates about how much money. Yeah. So I do see the idea, for example, that nature with full-time resident statisticians and running labs and all those different things, we'll get a higher per article rate than other article, other you know, diamond journal. But it 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 includes, it doesn't create yet another world. That whole thing is to bring within the scope. And if the legislation were to pass in the United States or in the EU, I had very interesting conversations there, then there would be, as there is with music, there would be a global distribution or global international agreements that would give local jurisdictions on a national level a chance for them to protect local interests. Yeah. Uh, and it would spread in that, that way. 
but it would begin to operate from the very beginning if there are major publishers as there are in the United States or in the EU. Yeah. Okay. You get the last um, question. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> more of just a small set of comments. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, you start with the question, is this time is this time to address the law? And you wanted that, the answer is yes. Oh, so good. You can Great. take that. Let me get that yeah. <laughs> you know, take that one. This, I'm actually very happy that you point out that it's important not to eliminate other ecosystem actors, commercial publishers. I, I remember the conversation with CPUP in the early days of open courseware and open education resources. And I think that that takes away the opportunity for these other actors, commercial publishers, to figure out what their role should be in this alternate economy. And if you don't do that, they'll come and cannibalize it. Yeah. I mean, this it's a it's a it's a you know it's a silly way to approach it. Right? The third thing that I care much more about educational content than scholarly content, and I'm sitting here trying to think what are the I understand that's more of an open access than a copyright yes. sort of thing. But uh, I'm trying to understand what are the implications for open content because that's something we care about because you talked about the pandemic, right? Yeah. Educational inequity is a serious kind of thing. Yeah. There's just slow death over centuries, right? And what does it speak, say about about so that? And okay. of course, my uh, my last point is sort of picking up from Cato. So just put it out there: is uh, you mention all these ecosystem actors, the stakeholders, the yeah, publishers, stakeholders. etc. What about the consumer? I mean, we are living in an economy you know, where the individual scholar itself is a consumer. So. What does it say to the rights and affordances for the individual? Okay, so the, so the let me start with that last part, and although I'll probably forget the previous one, but but the in, so the the researcher I want to argue is a, a great beneficiary of this proposal in terms of academic freedom um, and in terms of their ability to concentrate on their work and their ability to promote the progress of science. So each component of, of what I argue needs to be held to this value. Does it promote the progress of science because we have some horrific challenges ahead and we need the full weight of, and force of that of those researchers? And so it says they do not give a second thought to any aspect of how to negotiate open access, how to pay for open access, and how to comply with open access requirements of funders or of institutions. They simply move forward for where it is best for their work. And so that, to me, is the complete respect of their academic freedom. The larger consumer, the public, if you like, is a huge beneficiary of this, because though they're not considered a stakeholder, per se, in a technical sense, um, because they gain immediate access without saying whether they were the taxpayer that paid the bill. I mean, that, to me, is just so uh, parochial in terms of it was it an American funder, was it you know EU, EU funder? So, the, so that part, uh, and again, as a public educator, as a school teacher, this is a huge benefit. The previous point about uh, open content, and we have, I mean, we have that, you know, this is the home of, of that whole area. Um, I think it's a, it's a, it's a real, uh, it's two, let me give two aspects of that. One is you're welcome to use this as a model. Um, a second aspect is I, I did try to leave a few problems for others because it would be only greedy that, and you would say, well, you're acting like a publisher, Wolinsky. It's uh, It would only be, excuse me, it would only be greedy on my part to solve all the problems. So I left a few. But most importantly, and we've done this analysis, we've done, we've studied Canadian syllabuses in the last Supreme Court case on York versus Access Copyright, and we showed that 90% of the readings, the course readings, are academic scholarly and access copyright was asking for an enormous payment for those now the 10 percent, it's actually nine percent that are educational content there are the work of novelists and poets and journalists in particular those parts are not this has no bearing access copyright can charge and you do not get free access unless you use fair use you vote fair use but that's very tricky in the case of course content but we can talk about that so but but again i want you to see that this this very fine tailoring to solve what is important for the future of science not education and what you the leadership shown at this institution for the future of education through the pandemic absolutely but also globally 
in terms of open courseware um, is not is not impeded in any way. Like that would be the, the, the worst kind of charge you could make against me would be that this impedes the work that you've been doing here in, in education. I would say it contributes whatever proportion open education relies upon. Mm -hmm. And I'm also an advocate of not using textbooks. I'm, I'm relying more and more on firsthand research, certainly at the uh, senior undergraduate level. Uh, and this would encourage you to do that because you will not have to face okay. certain charges on it. So thank you for bringing that to the, yes, I almost forgot where I was in a sense. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great uh, place to end on. Thank you all so much for coming, those of you in the room, those of you tuned in remote, and special thanks to you, John, for bringing this uh, great idea to the to uh, us and to the world so that, like you said, it deserves, I, I truly believe it deserves our serious attention and debate. Well, that's, so. I, I am creating a list. <laughs> So I'm, and I'm looking around the room, kind of uh, expecting each of the organizations that you represent in some way to uh, allow me to uh, put that on, on a, a slide, or put that in some way, um, because in the practical, unfortunately, Valerie, no, um, Catherine, Catherine, oh. uh, she, she wanted the practical aspects. So the practical aspects in this country would likely be um, uh, getting the attention of the Copyright Office. Uh, and say that there is, what I need is not, uh, I need representation of each stakeholder. I need a major player in stakeholder dumb, and the libraries would be absolutely crucial, to say I have initial interest. I mean, I can't say that I, that I have representation in any numbers, but I can say I, the stakeholders have an interest. And who are those stakeholders? And they will look at who those stakeholders are. Mm -hmm. And then they will operate to hold public hearings, information gathering, and they will submit a, a summary, if they feel it's sufficient, to Congress, to the uh, committee, excuse me, um, the Committee on Copyright, where there is bipartisan support uh, for research and scholarship. We're, we're in a very good position in terms of that committee right now, again, the timing, um, where uh, Simons, I think, and Tillis, maybe, um, where we have that, kind of, so that would be the, the process. But before that, um, the kind of the conference, the 2030 and other events where it would help me build the list. And, and you can think strategically around what is, what's really missing. Is it, are there areas, uh, small institutions, are there areas within the library in terms of, like law is an interesting question because law is not peer reviewed and it's a kind of different economy. Um, the open courseware and open content group would be a very interesting element too, to say this actually does have an impact. The one group that will want to appear, that guaranteed, is the film industry. So no matter what you do, I've learned this lesson, that they will be at the front of the line to say, we have an opinion about open access to research and scholarship, and that opinion is it is a threat to the future of this country. Anything that weakens the hold of copyright as an exclusive right is a threat to America's vital Disney position in the world. <laughs> Welcome to America. Thank you, everybody. We'll, we'll be sure to send around the recording. Take good care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.